Hello everyone, I'm your host, your SCP host, Skills to Play. Welcome to the very anticipated Ultimate Guide for SCP Secret Laboratory. In today's video, I'll be teaching you everything you need to know about SCPSL in 2022. First off, what I need to get out of the way. This video will be split into parts or chapters which will cover different aspects of the game, such as SCPs or humans. If you don't want to watch a section, you can skip ahead to a different one that you want to watch. Note, while this guide can be interpreted as a successor to the 2020 guide, I'm not trying to be better than that guide, as that guide still stands as a good starting point for new players. I'm making this one to cover more up-to-date things as well as other things the 2020 guide did not cover. If you want a more in-depth guide on SCP, that is a great place to go. Another note, some of the things mentioned in this video are subject to change in the future, so I will try to keep things as general as possible so it can be used years down the line. With that out of the way, let us begin. Starting us off, we have SCP-173, probably one of the fan favorite SCPs, as well as being devastating early game if paired with the right conditions. I will be telling you those perfect conditions and how to meet them so you can go and snap all those necks. Always remember that 173 shouldn't go after large armed groups, such as an MTF respawn, but I'll tell you how to deal with them anyway. So, you want to learn how to play 173? Great! Then continue watching this tape to see how 173 can be a real kicker. Now, 173, as you may know, stops from being looked at. And you may think, oh no, this is horrible. But, we can use this time to our advantage. Let's take a look and see what our test subject here will demonstrate. Hello, test subject. Alright, let us begin. Oh, this is not the correct way. Try again. Good job. Now, let's move on to a different situation. Oh no, it looks like MTF has spawned. Let's see what our test subject does to combat this scenario. Well, that didn't go so well. Let's try again. Ah, it looks like he is communicating with SCP-079. Marvelous. Look at that. 173 went in and 079 blacked out the room. What a combo. That was a lot of information to take in. So, here are some quick steps that summarize what you have just learned. Step 1. Always try to use tantrum. It is very spammable. Step 2. Use breakneck speeds to get the advantage on someone. Step 3. Step 4. Watch people's movement so you can predict where they might end up. Step 5. Communicate with your team. Thank you for watching this educational tape. Now get out there and go sh The Plague Doctor. A very useful SCP if utilized correctly. Now, his whole gimmick is to be able to revive dead people within 10 seconds of them dying of any cause. This is huge as, as to how many SCPs there are and prevents more people from spawning as either MTF or Chaos Insurgents. In this section, you will learn some of the basics of how 049 works and some strategies for each stage of the game. In the early game, 049 should focus on either A, if close to entrance, surprise the guards and kill some of them early, or B, quickly get to light containment and start killing and making zombies. Sometimes you might even be able to do both. In the mid game, 049 should focus on having at least one or two zombies and should be actively searching out for more people. Finally, by the late game, 049 will most likely have three or more zombies and assumes the same strategy as the previous stage. As you can see, 
Zerfine is actually quite simple, so there isn't much to learn. But remember that Zero Four Nine is quite weak, so be careful when dealing with large groups of armed individuals, such as NTF or Chaos. An effective, albeit boring strategy, is to camp around a corner and wait for them to come to you. This Caliber 079 will grant you many kills as well as a horde of zombies. There's some nice boost right now, but don't worry. We got it under control, though. It's fine. Uh, uh, the computer, one of the most annoying SCPs to deal with as a human class, but also one of, if not the most effective SCP. Having a good 079 will almost guarantee you will win the game, and this part will teach you how to become a great 079. Now, 079 is all about reacting fast and communicating with your team. I know. I've said this a lot, but it is really important. So you need to be able to employ these methods to effectively and efficiently help your team. Zero Seven Nine can work well with any SCP, so he has a lot of versatility. A well-known example of this is with 173. Since Zero Seven Nine can black out rooms, 173 becomes almost unstoppable, unless they have a flashlight. But I think they should have no problem with that. Obviously, I don't really need to have enough time to fully cover each SCP, as these are brief summaries of them and some strats for them. They all deserve their own videos, but for now, just take these strats to heart and you'll learn. Both 93953 and 89 are functionally the same. Well, 53 has a smaller hitbox technically since his model is thinner, not as wide as 89, but that's barely a difference. And each of them come with their own set of tricks to spice up the facility. The whole thing with 939 is that when you aren't sprinting, you won't make any footsteps, so you can sneak up on people. You can also talk to humans, which can let you lure them into a trap. That's really it for 939, as there isn't too much to talk about with him. Now, an example of luring him to a trap is convincing someone to open SCP-914, and well, they might expect a person, guess who's there? SCP-939, surprise! Ah, the Shy Guy. A powerhouse of an SCP, but has a fatal weakness if you mess up. 096's gameplay is pretty basic. Someone looks at you and you rage, and you go and kill them. Simple. But the caveat lies when you come out of rage. You're vulnerable to a lot of damage for a short period of time, as there's a cooldown between rages. During this time, it should be of utmost priority to find cover and hide for around 6 to 10 seconds. This, hopefully, ensures you will have enough time to let the cooldown end and for you to continue killing. Uncle Larry, a very tanky SCP and one whose gameplay is generally disliked due to the campy nature he offers. A good tip for 106 is to place your portal behind your door to the containment chamber. This door, not that door. Or somewhere within your room. Preferably not on the walkway though, like going around to the secondary door. That, that is not a good place, I don't know why you'd put it there. Anyways, another thing to keep in mind is that later in the game, people will have good enough cards to access your room. So I'd recommend going back to your portal every time you take someone. This doesn't really apply to early game though, since no one really has any good cards. I'm just gonna go quickly through all the SCP items, since, well, they're also SCPs technically, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first SCP item is SCP-018, which is a pretty powerful item when you think about it, because it can open doors, like it, it can open locked doors, such as like micro, if you don't have the appropriate key card, so that's it. You can bounce straight into it, and boom, it's gone. So when you throw it, you can either light throw it by right clicking, or just like chucking it with left click. And I believe, It'll bounce for around 80 seconds, and it'll be immediately going super fast. So when you throw it, just get out of the way. It can also damage teammates after 10 seconds. Just a little, little thing. Next one, SCP-207. Everyone knows this one. You drink up to four. 
gives you temporary speed. Well, not temporary. As long as you have the effect, it gives you speed boost. And lets you sprint indefinitely. But the more colas you have, up to four, you take a lot of damage. So, uh, actually, pretty recent one, SCP-244 causes the hypothermia effect when placed after standing in the area of effect for a while. Um, you slowly start taking damage, and the damage ramps up as you stay in it longer. Uh, there's two versions. There's SCP-244-A and B. Both are the same, just different models. Next one is SCP-268, which is the invisibility hat. So you place it on, it makes you invisible for about 15 seconds. And after it's done, it has a cooldown of 2 minutes. Now, when you pull out, I believe, any item, like a gun or something, it brings you out of it. But you used to be able to have a gun out, and it would only come out once the effect actually ended or you shot. So it was pretty OP back then. But nowadays, it's been nerfed a bit, and it's... It's still good though, it's still a good way to uh, either scout ahead an area, or, you know, use it to get the drop on someone. Next one, SP500. Pretty simple. Heals up to 200 HP. It also grants a regeneration that lasts 10 seconds. And then it removes 207, burned, concussed, poisoned, deafened. And it also reduces the damage of bleeding, which isn't really used, but um, it makes it the lowest possible value. Oh, hello. I was just discussing, uh, testing. Anyways, thank you for joining me. I heard you needed some information regarding the different types of people we have to deal with here at Site 2 Perfect! I have all the files right here. First up, we have the Class D personnel, or as they call themselves, the Nemo! They make up most of the people on around, and usually go about doing the same few things. They either, one, die, two, become MTF, or three, become chaos. Now, let's say you're a D-Class. Depending on the person, you may either want to escape as MTF, if you want that type of gameplay, or as chaos, the clearly superior option. If you also like staying alive, follow these simple strategies. Get out of light as fast as you can. Staying in light only dooms you further. Avoid facility guards and MTF as much as possible if going for chaos. Or you can kill any in your way. And lastly, but most certainly not least, don't die. Moving on, we have the scientists. Scientists spawn with a medkit and a scientist keycard, which lets them open 914. Their objective is about the same as D-Class, except that their allies are with MTF. So usually they'll go for being MTF instead of chaos. Since they're about the same as the D-Class, I don't really think I need to repeat myself. After the scientists, we move on to the facility guards. Now, for some reason, I hear a lot of complaints about them. Something about being trash or sucking a lot. Well, I don't blame them though. They, try, they go in trying to deal with SCPs with an FSP-9. Something that I don't think is made for SCPs. But I'm not too knowledgeable about guns. But I do know a guy down by the armory that is. Anyways, their objective is to hold off the SCPs until either MTF or Chaos arrive. Bad news if Chaos arrives. Usually, what I have seen for facility guards is that they rush in without communication or any of the sort and die. What will set you apart is if you communicate and coordinate an attack on an SCP. You can even possibly kill it. Usually, something like 939 will die quickly if surrounded by guards. Speaking of MTF, here is the file on the mobile task force. These guys come equipped with better gear and better numbers to take on whatever SCP may have breached. Their objective is to take out any remaining SCPs and round up the chaos in D-Class. I have been hearing rumors though that their latest recruits are not that bright. It's just a rumor. I believe they are training them well. They're basically the same as photo guards, so communicate and coordinate, and you'll probably be fine. Nothing else super notable, but on the opposite side of the MTF is the Chaos Insurgency, whose objective it is to kill any MTF and save the D-Class. Now, for some reason, I've seen SCPs become less hostile and even become friendly with Chaos Insurgents. 
I'm not sure what those Chaos are doing, but if they can make the SCPs friendly, then we are doomed. All Chaos come equipped with some pretty good gear. I even heard that one of them has a light machine gun. Why don't we get those? Anyways, from what, I, what I've seen, they usually tend to either kill or be friendly with SCPs, which gives them a huge advantage if they go with the latter. Done reading the files? All right. Hmm? You wanna know more about the guns of the Foundation and Chaos? Well, I'm not the right person for that, but I do know a guy down in the armory who can tell you all about that. All right, see ya. Hey, you know I've been here the whole time, right? Oh shoot, I forgot you were here. I heard what you said about that chaos. Uh-oh. So, you want to learn about the guns at the Foundation, eh? And yeah, you've come to the right place. Here is where I'm going to teach you about each gun and their pros and cons. You ready? Let's begin. Let's see what we have here. Ah, here we go. The COM-15, a very sneaky sidearm, perfect for a revolution. It has three options for attachments, muzzle device, underbarrel, and magazine. The COM-15 can be equipped with a suppressor, flashlight, either a 12 or 17 round magazine. Do remember that the more attachments you add, the heavier it gets, thus increasing its pullout time. If you need to be quick, stick with the basics. If you want to be quiet, add suppressor. Next in line is the COM-18. We used to use the USP, but they stopped buying them and we just started using our own similar design. Speaking of, COM-18 has three options for attachments. Both device, underbarrel, sight. COM-18 has a few more options, in terms of attachments, as you can see here. But it stays run roughly the same playing field as the COM-15. After the COM-18, we have the FSP-9, the facility guard's weapon. A quite versatile weapon, as it comes with five different options for attachments. Muzzle, side rail, underbarrel, sight, stock. Depending on how you want to run it, you could go for a stealth build, or run a gun type build. Really, it is all up to you. I would recommend against using this to attack SCPs though. The better option when it comes to SMGs is the crossback. And while it only has four attachment options, muzzle, underbarrel, sight, and stock, they offer a much greater damage and control over the FSP-9. MTF privates spawn with this weapon and it packs quite a punch when 10 plus people are mowing you down with it. This can also run a run and gun type build and something more long range, whichever you prefer, or whichever the situation calls for. Moving on to a higher caliber, the MTF E11 SR, which honestly has too long of a name, so I just call it the ESR. It's a very powerful and useful weapon, being able to be configured into a variety of things, such as a longer range build with sniper scope and rifle receiver, or maybe something smaller for close to mid range. This gun has seven attachment options. Muzzle, receiver, side rail, underbarrel, magazine, sight, and stock. This is one of the most accurate weapons, as well as being useful for almost any situation. On the opposite side of the ESR is the AK, the weapon of choice for the Chaos Insurgency. Ooh, excuse me. Perfect to suppress their enemies. The AK has five attachment options. Muzzle, side rail, magazine, and stock. The AK is similar in terms of the type of builds it can run to the ESR, but remember that the AK uses a rarer ammo type, 762. So usually the ESR is going to be a more viable option since more ammo is available, but the AK definitely has more prominence. Moving back to sidearms, we have the big iron, or the revolver. It comes equipped with four attachment options, Barrel, sight, cylinder, and stock. With the right setup, you can one-shot headshot people. It's really satisfying when you do that. And otherwise, do a lot of damage. Another thing is that you can cock the weapon before firing, so you don't need to pull the trigger 
for longer to fire the weapon, and in that time frame, could mean your demise. You know your time is coming, or for your enemy, when you hear the distinct sound of the shotgun. A powerful weapon when utilized correctly. It has three attachment options, muzzle, sight, and side rail. Proper build can let you snipe people across the room, or destroy people up close. I've heard people complain about it being underwhelming, but don't listen to them. They just don't get to know this beauty of engineering. Last, but most certainly not least, is the Logister. A crazy LMG that can put lead downrange faster than you could say peanut. Coming in with only three attachment options, muzzle, underbarrel, and sight. This beast can be equipped to have virtually no recoil, and thus lets you laser things miles away. No joke, this thing is more accurate than the ESR. Well, only if you're barely moving or standing still, as moving faster or jumping will cause it to deviate a lot. But if you can manage to stay still, that is a lot of suppressing fire you can put on your enemies. I just want to quickly touch on the difference between base game and plugins. You may have noticed when choosing a surfer that some of them, or actually most of them, have a modded tag next to them. This is to indicate that a server has plugins enabled no matter how many. Either it be 1, 2, 20, whatever. These servers will usually have stuff like this. And base game will lack these things. Depending on what you want, both experiences offer a lot of fun, so I'd recommend trying them out and seeing how it goes. Whether you want to have plugin experience or vanilla experience, it's all up to you. Well, I think that about wraps it up for this guy. I really do hope you enjoyed watching, and if you did, uh, leave a like if that helps the algorithm and this this video. Hopefully attract me close to the game. Uh, if uh, you enjoyed the video, you can even consider subscribing, as we are really close to here for the cave to make it happen. If you believe I didn't cover something, let me know in the comments. I really appreciate feedback, and if there's enough... Okay. Oh, what was that? Oh, anyways, if there's enough, I can make a part two or say something to cover it under niche things. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. Oh no.